All right, let's try to simplify some sigma notation using some formulas we've seen in the past. So if you're, so kind of imagine if you're trying to calculate a derivative or an antiderivative or something, let's think about derivatives, which we know pretty well by this time in calculus. If you wanted to take the derivative of x times 4x squared minus 3, probably the first thing you would want to do is distribute. If you distribute the variable through, that kind of avoids some unnecessary, um, some unnecessary product rule here. Sigma is no different. We like things to be distributed out if we can, ha if we can afford it. So if you distribute the i through, you get 4i cubed minus 3i. Take the sum as i goes from 1 to n. And also, if you were taking the derivative of a polynomial, you would break it up into pieces. So, uh, like, if, if you broke it up into a, into a difference there, you're going to get the sum of 4i cubed minus the sum of, let me draw that sigma again, the sum of 3i as i goes from 1 to n, 1 to n. This is exactly what we do, like, with derivatives. And those constant multiples, right? We have this factor of 4, factor it out. We have this factor of 3, factor it out of the sum. Uh, because sigma is a linear operation, we are justified in pulling out this factor. So we get 4 times the sum, where i goes from 1 to n of i cubed, minus 3 times the sum of just i, as i goes from 1 to n. Right? And so at this moment, if we were taking derivatives, like we're taking the derivative of i cubed and the derivative of i, we would apply the power rule. Uh, for derivatives. We did the same thing for antiderivatives. Well, for sigma, we have to apply basically the sigma power rule. What do you do with powers of i right here? And we talked about these in the previous video. Look at the links below um, if you want to see what exactly those were. But as a reminder, we saw that if you take the sum of i cubed, uh, this is equal to n squared times n plus 1 squared over 4. And if you take the sum of i, this will be n times n plus 1 over 2. And so we're going to apply those formulas in this context here. Uh, we end up with 4 times n squared times n plus 1 squared all over 4 minus 3 times n times n plus 1 over 2. And so it's going to be helpful if we can combine uh, like terms if possible. Uh, some, some things to note here. 4 does divide with 4, but in order to add these things together, I do want a common denominator of 2. So I'm only going to cancel. I'm going to rewrite 4 over 4 as 2 over 2. And so then we can write this sum together as uh, the following. We get 2n squared times n plus 1 minus 3 times n times n plus 1 all over 2. So we have that common denominator. Let's also factor out any common factors we have. Uh, we have a, a factor of n that's common to both. There's also an n plus 1 that's common to both. That should be a squared right there. I forgot to write it earlier. And so when we factor that thing out, you can factor out an n and n plus 1. That leaves behind 2n times n plus 1 minus 3. Uh, there's not going to be much more hope of factoring that until you distribute the 2n through the n plus 1 there. Uh, so if we do that, we have n times n plus 1. Uh, so then we get 2 n squared plus 2n minus 3, like so. This all sits above 2. And there's really not any other... Um, the, the 2n squared plus 2n minus 3, there does, there's no factorization that's going to work on that thing right here. So we're going to leave this thing... Uh, we're we're going to now say that's done right there. We found a formula for the sum of the original function. And it's going to be a rational function in terms of n because each of the power rules for sigma give us a rational function in terms of the variable i right there. Uh, that is, that is, it's going to be n in the end, sorry. Um, how about the next one right here? Uh, let's evaluate the sum where i goes from 1 to n of i to the fourth minus 1 minus i to the fourth again. Well, I can pause this right here that if we go back to the previous video about this sigma power rule, we don't have a sum for the fourth power. So what do we do with this? Well, we could try to derive the fourth power or we could try to kind of remember where it came from. Um, if we write this in expanded form, we're going to get 1 to the fourth minus 0 to the fourth. Uh, the next one, if we do the second term, we're going to get 2 to the fourth minus 1 to the fourth. Uh, the third term, it will look like 3 to the 4th minus 2 to the 4th, etc. And this will continue on until we get to the end. We're going to get n to the 4th 
minus n minus 1 to the fourth. And so this principle of a telescoping sum comes up again. This is what we call a telescoping sum. The principle of the telescoping sum is going to come up here because we have the 1 to the fourths cancel, the 2 to the fourths will cancel, the 3 to the fourths will cancel, and that everything will cancel except for the n minus 1 to the fourth here. And so the only thing is that don't cancel is the final n to the fourth and also the original zero. So we end up with this sum using this telescoping principle here. Uh, telescoping sum. We never actually finished writing that. You get n to the fourth minus zero to the fourth which that, of course, simplifies just to be n to the fourth. So it's important to look for telescoping sums. It turns out they can help us simplify many of these types of sums. Well, this is a calculus class, after all. So our goal is going to be taking limits of these sigma uh, operations here. So what if we take the limit as n goes to infinity of the sum, where one goes from uh, i goes from 1 to n, of the quantity of the sequence 3 over n times i squared over n squared plus 1? Well, that sounds like a mouthful, right? There's a lot going on there, but why, why do we even care about such a thing like that? Well, guess what? We will do that later. Well, the, these, these type of limits will actually be quite natural things in the right context. We're not there right now. Uh, we're sort of going to be the karate kid right now. We're learning to wax the, wax the car and paint the fence, but we're really learning karate the whole time. So let's not worry about the limit process yet. We'll come back to that. Uh, later on the problem. Let's try to work with this sigma right here. So we take the limit as n goes to infinity. Um, what can we do here? Well, one thing to note is that, uh, let me get rid of these parentheses for a moment, that when it comes to the sigma, the variable with respect to this operation is the i. And so with regard to sigma, every other symbol you see is a constant. The 3, the plus 1, those are constants. But with respect to the sigma, the variable is i, and therefore this 3 over n is itself a variable. It's con I, and I shouldn't say it's a variable, it's a constant. It doesn't change as i changes, so we can factor it out the same way we would factor out a 7. And so if we factor that out, we're going to get the limit, as n goes to infinity, of 3 over n. And then we get the sigma of i squared over n squared plus 1 right here as n as i excuse me goes from 1 to n so we can factor out the 3 over n because it doesn't depend on the i uh, next we have a sum inside of our sigma uh, so we can break it up into two sums using the linearity property of sigma so we get the limit as n goes to infinity of 3 over n uh, we're going to get the 1 over n squared sigma of i squared as i goes from 1 to n. And then we add to that sigma of 1 as i goes from 1 to n. Um, you'll notice also over here I took the liberty of taking the 1 over n squared out of the sigma because, again, the sigma's variable is i. The 1 over n squared is constant with respect to sigma. And so for the sum of i squares, we can apply the appropriate formula uh, for that one. And as a reminder of what that is, we saw this in, a, in the previous video, that if you take the sum of i squared as i goes from 1 to n, this will always turn out to be n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 all over 6. So we're just going to kind of memorize this and use it in this place right here. So, the, so we get this... The limit of 3n times 1 over n squared times the n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 all over 6. And then we have to add up together the sum of the n's, uh, sorry, the sum of 1. But this is just 1 added together n times, so that just becomes an n. Uh, so we put that right here. Oh, maybe for the sake of uh, simplicity, I'll try to squeeze it in. In right there. So what do we have? So if you look at this, all the i's are now gone. This is the advantage of those formulas we have for sigmas. All the i's are gone. And now we're taking a limit as n goes to infinity of a rational expression in terms of n. This is stuff we did earlier in the semester. Let's try to compute this thing. Uh, if we take the limit as n goes to infinity, uh, we're going to end up with the following. We are going to get, if we distribute some things through, uh, so we're going to distribute this 3 over n to both pieces. Doing that, we will get 
3 times n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 all over 6 n cubed. That's the first fraction. For the second fraction, we're going to end up with a 3n over n, like so. And so we want to take the limit as n goes to infinity. Now, you could um, try to simplify these fractions a little bit, because after all, there's like a common factor of n right there. Uh, there's a 3 that goes into a 6. This n kind of cancels out with this one right here. You can do all those things. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wait to do that, because as n goes to infinity, when you have a rational function, all that matters is the leading terms. So when you look at this, the, the, the first fraction, the, the, the 6 over n cubed in denominator, this is our dominant term. But who's the dominant term on top? Well, you would take the product of all the leading terms. So 3n times n times 2n on top. And so what we're going to see is that as n goes to infinity, this rational expression is no different than just 3n cubed over 6n cubed. And then the second term... As you take the 3n over n, uh, well, there's those are just monomials already as it is. So you can ignore all the fluff and only look at the dominant terms right here. So as n goes to infinity, uh, this thing can be, these things can now simplify down, right? The n cubes cancel, the n's cancel, and we end up with 3 sixths plus 3. Uh, 3 sixths, of course, is the same thing as uh, a 1 half. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I made a mistake. I got to correct this before anyone... Uh, punches me in the face or something. When we did this one over here, this wasn't just an n. This was a 2n. So we got we get 3n times n times 2n, which actually makes this a 6n cubed. Sorry about that. Um, and so that gives us a 6 right here. 6 over 6 is going to become a 1. We get 1 plus 3, which is equal to 4. And so the limit of that sum from the very beginning is equal to 4. Let's come back to this thing. This thing is equal to 4. All right, I see how that calculation works, but what is this thing, right? What is that even measuring? Well, young grasshopper, we will have to learn that next time before we're ready to battle the Cobra Kai. Uh, stay tuned uh, for, for upcoming lectures. We'll, we'll give some answers to the questions I'm posing at the end of our lecture right here. Um, if you did like the videos you've been watching, feel free to subscribe for further updates, uh, post some comments, uh, like it if you do. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to post them in the comments. This not in this video, but all the videos. Um, I'll see your comments, and I'll try to uh, respond to them in a, in a quick manner. If you have any questions, let's learn some calculus together. See you next time.